الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الهداة المهديين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How many of us keep a relationship with the Imam of our time? Al Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ajal Allah Rajahu Sharif. How many of us actually think about the Imam of our time? How many of us interact with the Imam in a way in which it shows that I really believe that he is alive and amongst us. Because the Imam is not hiding anymore. The Imam is just working undercover. We don't know who the Imam is. His identity has been concealed. But the Imam lives amongst us. How many of us actually show that in our lives? How many of us think about the 12th Imam? Speak to the 12th Imam. Just because I can't see him prevents me from speaking to him. Don't I speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day when I stand to pray? Then why can, why can I not speak to the Imam of my time just because I cannot see him? This is a point that many people struggle with when it comes to the relationship with the Imam of their time. When you can't see the Imam, some individuals, they start to be distracted and they start to act as if the Imam does not even exist. Because it's difficult to form a relationship with someone that you can't see. And eventually the Imam becomes an abstract concept. Not a real person that's alive that we can connect to, that we can be attached to. So this is something that many of us may struggle with. How does someone maintain a good relationship with the Imam? Tonight I want to speak about a beautiful dua. One of the duas that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt taught us. And this dua, brothers and sisters, if you make it a habit, and a part of your life, it can potentially change your life. It is so powerful that it can change your life dramatically and create a very strong, beautiful bond between you and the Imam of your time. And that will have so many beautiful effects on your life, positive. Because if someone is connected to the Imam of their time, that will definitely reflect on every part of their life. That dua is called dua ul ahd. It's a dua many of you know, many of you have heard about. But I feel it's one of the underrated and underestimated duas of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu was salam. Al ahd in the Arabic language means covenant. It means you're forming a covenant with someone, a promise. So dua al ahd is a promise, a covenant between you and Sahib al Asri wa Zaman that I will always remember you. I will always follow you, and I'm always ready for you at serving your causes. This beautiful dua is narrated by Imam As-Sadiq alayhi salam Sayyid ibn Tawus, Al-Mashhadi, all the ulama, they narrate this hadith, this dua from Imam As-Sadiq in their books. And the hadith is narrated in this way. The Imam As-Sadiq said, and remember, Imam al-Sadiq, even during his time, many a hadith about the 12th Imam. Why? Because ever since the time of Rasulullah, the Imams, the Prophet used to speak about the awaited Savior. They used to speak about the Imam that will rise and fill the world with justice. So in this dua that Imam al-Sadiq teaches us, and we'll inshallah go over it and see how we can benefit from it in our lives. He says, مَنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ بِهَذَا الدُّعَى أَرْبَعِينَ صَبَاحًا Whoever recites this ahad, this dua, 40 mornings, you 
recite it during the morning period. Yeah, I mean, after Salat al-Subur, you have until a couple of hours after that. Whoever does it for 40 days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him these things. Number one, kana min ansari qa'imina. That person will be a supporter of the 12th Imam. But then you may say, what if I read this and I die before the Imam? Allah will guarantee that you will be one of the companions of the 12th Imam. The Imam says, وَإِنْ مَاتَ If you die before the Imam reappears, the Imam al-Sadiq says, أَخْرَجَهُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ قَبْرِهِ Allah will revive you, resurrect you, raise you from the dead when the Imam reappears so that you can be one of his companions and supporters. And then the Imam says, وَعْطَاهُ اللَّهِ بِكُلِّ كَلِمَةٍ أَلْفَ حَسَنَةٍ وَمَحَا عَنْهُ أَلْفَ سَيِّئَةٍ Just for reading this beautiful du'a al-ahd. For each word. How many words are there in this du'a? I don't know, 500, 1000. For each word, Allah Azza wa Jal will give you 1000 hasanat and Allah will erase 1000 sins. So look at the beauty of this du'a. The thawab, the ajr that you get. The cleanliness of the sins that this du'a gives us is so beautiful and in addition it guarantees that you will be a companion of the 12th Imam. After that the Imam mentions, he teaches us how to do this dua and it will not take you more than 4-5 or five minutes to recite it. And this dua can be divided into 5 parts. If I want to quickly go over this dua, it can be divided into 5 parts. The first part is the dua begins by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And most of the du'as of Ahlul Bayt, they begin by praising Allah azza wa jah. Because Allah is the source of everything. Du'a kumayl, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi rahmatika allati wasi'at kulla shayin. Oh Allah, I ask you by your mercy that encompasses everything. Du'a al-iftitah, Allahumma inni aftatihul Thana'a bihamdik. Dua al-iftita'a, oh Allah, I open aslan. I start my dua, my praise, by sending my praise towards you. And likewise, this beautiful dua, dua al-ahd, the Imam says, start like this. Allahumma rabban nur al-azim, wa rabban kursi al-rafi' wa rabban bahr al-masjur, ومنزل التوراة والإنجيل والزبور ورب الظل والحرور ومنزل القرآن العظيم. So you begin by praising Allah and you appeal to Allah سبحانه وتعالى's greatness. رب النور العظيم. Allah is the one who contains and possesses the great light. Allah سبحانه وتعالى رب الكرسي الرفيع. He is the Lord. Of Al Kursi Al Rafi of the Grand Kursi. What is Kursi? Not a chair. But they say it is the central command station of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wasi'a kursiyu samawati wal ar. Warab al Bahr al Basjur and Allah is the Lord of the seas and when they fill and sometimes overflow. And He is the one that brought down all of the holy books until you say, Allahumma inni as'aluk. Now you plead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You appeal to Him. You ask Him. Oh Allah, I ask you بِوَجْهِكَ الْكَرِيمِ I ask you by your generous face. And the face of Allah is a figure of speech. It's not the literal face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The face is always what? The body part that you address someone with. If you want to go to someone, and you go to and speak to that person, you address the face. You don't address the hands. You don't address the feet. The face of Allah means... The door to Allah Azza wa Jal. How do you go to Allah? How do you address Allah? Through the wajh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who's the wajh of Allah Azza wa Jal? It is none other than Ahlul Bayt. Alayhimu salatu salam. Many traditions mention that. Meaning they are the door to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you say, Allahumma anni as'aluka. Bi wajhika al-kareem wa bi nuri wajhika al-muni. And the nur of your generous face. وَمُلْكِكَ الْقَدِيمِ And I ask you, appeal to you by your mulk, by your sovereignty, by your kingdom, by your power. يَا مُحْيَ الْمَوْتَى يَا مُمِيتَ الْأَحْيَاء Allah Azza wa Jal is the one that revives the dead. And He what? He brings death to the people that are alive. 
So you appeal to all the powers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has so that then you can make your dua. Then you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for what you need. So the first part of dua al-ahd focuses on praising Allah azza wa jal. On appealing to the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a lesson. Every time you do dua, brothers and sisters, you want your dua to be answered. You want the chances of your dua to, to be higher, for it to be answered. Begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anytime you're sitting, you're doing dua, Laylatul Qadr is going to come, inshallah, we sit to do dua. Begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorifying Him. When you go to ziyarah and you want to do dua, begin by Allah. Always begin with Allah. That's why every chapter of the Quran begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Begin everything. You begin your day with Bismillah, you end your day with Bismillah. You begin your meal with Bismillah, you end your meal with Bismillah. So make sure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always on your mind, but specifically when you want to start a dua. This is part one of dua al ahd Part two of Dua Al-Ahad is when the Imam then he moves towards sending the blessings of Allah upon the 12th Imam and his forefathers. You ask Allah to send his blessings and his mercy upon the 12th Imam and his forefathers. This is what the Imam says. This is what you read. Allahumma balla mawlana al-Imam al-Hadi al-Mahdi mention some of the qualities of the 12th Imam. Oh Allah, I ask you to convey to the 12th Imam and his forefathers, what? I ask you to convey to him not just from me, but on behalf of every believer. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to send his blessings and his rahmah upon the Imam. And then you say, Zina ta'arshillah wa midada kalimatih wa ma ahsahu ilmuh. I ask you to send blessings how much? As much knowledge as Allah Azza wa Jalla. As much as the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how much I want Allah to send His blessings and His rahmah upon the 12th Imam and His forefathers. Wa ma ahsahu ilmuh wa ahata bihi kitabuh min as salawat. I ask you. To send your convey the salawat upon the 12th Imam. Now, a question here that may come to our mind is why do we ask Allah to send his salawat? And I mentioned this a couple of nights ago when we ask Allah to send his salawat or his salat upon any person, upon a makhluk, it's a form of dua, meaning, Ya Allah, bless that person, show that person mercy, elevate that person's status. So the question is here, does Al-Imam Al-Mahdi even need my dua? Isn't he ma'soom? Isn't he infallible? Isn't he directly connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So what will my dua really add to anything? I'm a sinner. I'm someone who commits so many mistakes. I am someone who is fallible. I am someone who could barely even have my dua answered for myself, let alone for someone else. So why are we doing dua for the Imam? And not just in dua al-ah, Allahumma kulli waliyika al Why do we do dua? People may ask, the Imam doesn't need your dua. So why do you do dua for the Imam? Now first of all, this is not just with the Imam. Anyone objects to this, even the Quran tells us to do dua for Rasulullah. We mentioned this a few nights ago in the famous verse, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Allah and, his, Allah and His angels, they send their salawat. Dua, it's a form of dua. Their blessings upon the Prophet. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا The Quran orders us. صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا So Allah orders us to do dua for the Prophet. Why? Does Rasulullah need my dua? The greatest creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason we do dua for Rasulullah, for an Imam, anyone that may be infallible and it seems like he doesn't need my dua, is for these two main reasons. Number one, when you do dua for the 12th Imam, you are showing the Imam that you care for them. You care for him. You're thinking about him. You know, sometimes some people, they come and they tell you that, you know, I went for ziyarah. And I did dua for you. Doesn't that make you happy? Doesn't that make you feel 
that this person respects you? Is it necessarily because that dua of this person will definitely be answered? No. Not necessarily. As in the dua of that person may not even be answered. There are sometimes some normal people who go to a marjah and they tell them, Mawlana, when I do ziyara, when I do dua, I do dua for you. That makes them happy. Why? Does that person always need this person, that person's dua? It's not about need. It's about showing love and respect. The fact that when I went, I did not forget about you. You were on my mind. I thought about you. And this in itself makes the Imam proud. When he sees that his Shia's followers think about him, at least in dua, that we don't act as if he's not there. We haven't forgotten him. We haven't neglected him. We haven't abandoned him. At least in my dua, and this is the least thing I can do for the Imam, when I do dua, I remember you, Ya Sahib al-Zaman. You may not need my dua, but I want to have that attachment and relationship with you. So every day I will do dua for you. So it shows your love and affection for the Imam. And there's a hadith from an Imam al-Kafim alayhi salam where he speaks about the Shia of the Imam during the Ghaybah. He says this, this is one of their qualities. He says, yes, You cannot see him physically. But then he says, وَلَا يَغِيبُ عَنْ قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ ذِكْرًا But the mu'mineen, the believers during the ghaybah are the ones, even if he is physically absent, but spiritually in our hearts, in the believers' hearts, he will never be absent. He will always fill a specific part of our heart that will never be forgotten. This is a true follower of Sahib al-Asri wa zaman So we do dua for the imam, so that we show him there's this connection, we care for him, and we think about him. That's number one. Number two, the second reason we do dua for the Imam or the Prophet is because we benefit. I benefit from my dua for the Imam more than he benefits. Why? Because anytime you do a dua for someone that is kareem, generous, that individual who you do a dua for, that individual who is kareem and generous will never forget the good act that you did for them. Even if it's very small and insignificant. If someone comes to a kareem, a generous person, and gives them even the smallest gift, they will not forget it. They will try to return that gift. And if you are kareem, you will give back a much greater gift. Sahib al-Asli wa zaman is the manifestation of the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you do dua for him, you don't think he will do dua for you? Someone comes to me, I a weak, infallible, an ignorant being, tells me, Sayyid, I did dua for you and I went to Karbala. When I go to Karbala, I won't do dua for them. If I don't do dua for them, that means I'm not a kareem, I'm not generous. I'm someone that does not appreciate other people's gifts for me. So I do dua for the Imam so that he does dua for me. And when the Imam does a dua for you, brothers and sisters, all the greatness, all the good of this dunya and akhirah, you will achieve, you will attain. There's a famous story that happened during the time of Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. It's narrated that in the city of Isfahan, in the city of Isfahan, there was a financial problem, there was a drought, an economic condition, situation wasn't good. So the people of Isfahan, they were really struggling and losing patience. So they decided to form a delegation to send that delegation to the capital in Samarra because Isfahan was under the Abbasid kingdom then, during the time of Imam Hadi. So to someone goes, a group of an envoy, goes to Samarra to speak to the king, the Khalifa, to help us in Isfahan. Amongst those individuals that was chosen was a man by the name of Abdul Rahman, a young man, maybe in his 20s. Abdul Rahman was very courageous and outspoken, so they chose him. Now the city of Asfahan, now you find it's mostly followers of Ahlul Bayt, Shia. But during the time of the Imam, there were rarely any Shias. So there wasn't Shia. There was not a Shia community in Asfahan. Except this man, Abdul Rahman. So he was asked about the story. He was asked, why did you become a Shia? You're in Asfahan. Shujabak ala Imam al-Hadi. What brought you to the 
Ahlul Bayt because many parts of the world till now they don't even know who Ahlul Bayt are they don't have any knowledge about Ahlul Bayt and once they hear about Ahlul Bayt this is when they fall in love with them and thus Imam al says he says عَلِّمُ النَّاسَ مَحَاسِنَ كَلَامِنَا فَإِنَّ النَّاسَ لَوْ عَرِفُوا مَحَاسِنَ كَلَامِنَا لَتَّبَعُونَا Tell people about our words. When they hear our words, they'll fall in love with our words. So this man, Abdul Rahman, says, I was chosen. He's an old man when he tells the story. He says, when I was younger, I was chosen to go to Samarra. We went to Samarra by the palace of Al-Mutawakkid. They wouldn't let us in. So we kept on waiting, waiting, waiting until maybe something will happen and they will let us in. Salli ala Muhammad wa He says, all of a sudden, one day, he says, we hear some guards, they come from the palace and they say that there is an arrest warrant for Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi. So the guards, they ride their horses and they go towards the house of an Imam al-Hadi. So he says, I wondered who's this Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi they want to arrest. So I heard some people talking. I asked them, what is, what's going on? They said, yeah, the mutawakkil has summoned al-Hadi and it seems like he's in trouble. Most likely he will not make it this time. I mean, he's probably going to be killed. So he says, I felt sorry for them, for this man, whoever he is, Ali ibn Muhammad. He says, I said, let me stay and see who is he. What did he do? He says, after a while, I see those guards, they have surrounded a man sitting on a horse. And he says, the Imam, he didn't know who he is. The Imam comes closer and closer until he's arriving to the palace of Al-Mutawakkil. He says, the Imam had his face down. He says, as soon as my eyes fell on the face of the Imam, the glorious face of the Imam, he says, I fell in love with him. The Haiba, the aura, the majesty of the Imam. He says, I was captivated and gravitated towards the Imam. You know, love at first sight, sometimes it happens. He says, I fell in love with this man. He says, so right away I started to do dua silently within myself. Ya Allah, please protect this man because he looks like a very good noble man. Please protect him from the wrath of Al-Mutawakkil. He says, I did this dua secretly in my heart. I've never met an Imam Al-Hadi. He's never met me. I don't even know who he is. He says the Imam came forward. His head was down. He wasn't looking at anybody until he arrived at my sight before he entered the palace. He says, when he arrived at my sight, he didn't look at anyone or say any words until he reached me. When he reached me, he looked at me. And he told me, Ya Abd rahman Subhanallah, you know my name. He says, Ya Abd rahman Allah Azza wa Jal has answered your dua. Laqad istajab Allahu du'aak. Wa razaqaka. Wa razaqaka malan wa wuldan wa umran tawi. Allah Azza wa Jal will grant you a long life, a lot of wealth, and a lot of children. He says the dua, the Imam made this dua for me. He says, when I heard that, I was shocked. How did he know I did this dua for him? How did he know this? He says, so I was puzzled, I was confused. I didn't tell anyone. But he says, that was the spark eventually. That was what made me become a lover of Imam al-Hadi and a Shia of Ahlul Bayt Now he is telling the story. And by the way, Imam al-Hadi was not killed. He came out that time from the palace safe. He's in his 70s when he tells the story. He says, now I'm in my 70s. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prolonged my life now. 13, 1200 years ago, living up to your 70s and you're healthy, this in itself was you know, a very good thing that wasn't too common. So he says, I'm in my 70s. He says, just in my store, I have 1 million dirhams cash. That's just the cash that I have. I'm a millionaire. And Allah has given me 10 children. The dua of the imam, 40, 50 years ago, has come to fruition. What did he do to deserve them? He did one small du'a. Ya Allah protect Al-Hadi. 
And Imam Al-Hadi, he did such a great dua. And when the Imam does a dua for you, Allah doesn't reject the Imam. So we do dua to the Imam so that maybe, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe the Imam, and not maybe for sure, the Imam will do dua for us. He will ask Allah to grant us Iman, to grant us firmness, to grant us taqwa, to piety, patience, to grant us the steadfastness and the path of Allah and the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wassalam, husn al to stay always firm on the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wassalam, and all the other hajat that we may have. So this is why we do dua for the Imam. So never be greedy with your dua when it comes to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. So this is the second part of Dua al -Ahd. See, beautiful. Number one reminds you about Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah is the center. Allah is the source of everything. So thus I begin by pleading to Him and turning to Him and asking Him. Number two, you turn to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Sahib al-Zaman and his fathers. And you ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless them, to send His salawat upon them shows that you're thinking about them, you love them, you care for them, and once again, you will receive the grace and the mercy of the Imams, alayhi This is number two. Number three, the Imam transitions in Dua Al-Ahd to the third part. And the third part is probably the most beautiful and the most important part of this Dua, and because of it, it is called Dua Al-Ahd. This is when we what? Renew our allegiance for the Imam of our time. How many of us have paid our allegiance to Sahib al -Sama? How many of us? Some of us never. Yes, I know I have an Imam, that's it. Have we paid, have we paid our allegiance to him? This dua reminds us every day to pay your allegiance to the Imam. Allahumma, this is what the Imam teaches us. Allahumma inni ujaddidu lahu fi sabihatiha, fi sabihati yawmi hadha, wa ma ishtu min ayyam hayati. Ahdan wa aqdan wa bay'atan lahu fi unuqi la azulu wa la ahulu anha abada. Ya Allah, today and this morning and every day until I die, I renew my allegiance. I pledge my allegiance to Sahib al Zaman. I renew my covenant with Sahib al Zaman. And I will never go against this pledge. I will never go against this covenant. How beautiful, brothers and sisters. Imam, the Imam is not just a, con, uh, a concept. No! Pay your allegiance to him. Just like he was in the state of Hudur, in the state of Hayyab. I renew my allegiance to him. Now why? What's the point of renewing our allegiance to him? Number one, when you re renew your allegiance to the Imam every day, this is a constant reminder that you have an Imam. There is an Imam of your time. He's alive. You can turn to him. He is the Bab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're stressed, if you're depressed, if you have problems, if you have adversities, if you are suffering, if you are in a dead end, it feels like there's no way out. Know that there is an Imam of your time. Just like when the companions, they would feel that their chests are very tight and they can turn to no one, you turn to the Imam of your time. And you know that he's here, he's there. And he can intercede on your behalf. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will what? Will answer the dua. Because many times we feel hopeless. But when you constantly pay your allegiance to the Imam, then you will never become hopeless. Because the Imam is there. The Imam can hear you. He's the Imam of your time and he's alive. So we pay our allegiance to remind ourselves that there is an Imam. And this Imam, Ajallah Farjahu Sharif, expects certain things from me because he's my Imam, he's my leader. Just like if the Imam was in a state of Hudur, the Imam in the state of Ghaybah, don't think he's not there, he is invisible. No, he's there. So be prepared for him all the time. And this is a concept that we perform every single day, you know, even with Allah. Why is it every day? We say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Every single day, we say, there is no God but Allah. Okay, khalas, I know there is no God but Allah. Why do I repeat it 20 times a day? Why is it mustahab to hold the tasbih, the simha, and say, la ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. I remember once I was at a debate between an atheist and a theist. 
The atheist, when he was making his claim against religion, against God, he was mocking religious people and religions. He was saying, if God is a reality, why every day do you say there is no God but Allah? There is no God but Allah. There's no, it's like someone that's saying there is gravity every day. There is gravity. I bear witness that there is gravity. He was mocking this. Well, this is the silliest argument. The reason we reaffirm the, sh the shahadatain every day, why? Because we human beings are easily distracted by the dunya. Easily the dunya distracts us and I forget that I have a Lord. I forget that there is a prophet and a religion and there are there is halal and haram. So when you remind yourselves every day so that you can stay focused. Remember Allah is watching. Remember there are duties. Remember there is akhirah. We spoke about this. The state of ghafla, how we human beings quickly go in a state of ghafla and we forget everything. So when we human beings are always prone to falling into ghafla, which is forgetfulness, heedlessness, you always need a reminder every single day. So every single day, remind yourself that I have the imam of my time. This is number one. Number two, when you pay your allegiance to the imam, it's not just the imam, it's the values that the imam stands for. It's the values that the imam, inshallah, will rise and establish. So when we remind ourselves and when we pay allegiance to the Imam, that means, Ya Imam, I am committed, not just to you as a person, but to your path, to your cause, to your mission with justice and whatever it may be. So it's a constant reminder of the morals and the values that the Imam stands for, that I am committed to them. What does the Imam stand for in my eyes? By paying my allegiance to the Imam, I'm reminding myself that I'm committed to the values that he stands for. And you know, this is something that's done in schools. I don't know if every country in the world, but at least I know in the U.S. You know, in the U.S. in elementary school, from first to fifth grade, maybe even kindergarten, every day, you know how they begin their school? They begin their school by all standing up. There is a flag of the U.S. They put their hands on their chest, and they say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to whatever it symbolizes, blah, 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 blah. And I ask them, why? It's just a flag. Why every day? So no, this flag symbolizes what? Freedom, symbolizes democracy, human rights, symbolizes uh, liberty, life, sovereignty, whatever. All the values that the U.S. was built on, this flag is a constant reminder so we never forget. So if every day our kids, I don't know, do they do this in Kuwait every day? Do they pledge their allegiance every day in schools? If we're doing it for our countries and our flags, is it so far-fetched that I do it for the Imam of my time? A flag! A flag, what is it? Well, it's not a living being. But they say, no, look at it as a symbol. So it's not too much to pay our allegiance to the Imam every single day, brothers and sisters. Because we need that constant reminder so we never forget it. This is the third part of Dua Al-Ahd. The fourth part of Dua Al-Ahd, which is also very, very beautiful, and Imam Al-Sadiq teaches us to do the Dua, to become supporters of the Imam. Allahumma j'alni min ansarih. Ya Allah, make me amongst his supporters. Wa a'wanih, wa an and those that protect the Imam with everything they have. And those that rush, rush so that they can do something for the Imam, answer a haja, fulfill a haja of the Imam, serve the Imam. Ya Allah, make me amongst the servants of Sahib al Zaman. Make me, make me amongst those that try our best to please Sahib al-Zaman and ultimately make me amongst the shuhada under the Imam. Now, when the Imam reappears, this dua makes sense. Allow me to serve the Imam. The Imam, I serve him in any way. I fight for him, I bring stuff for him, whatever he needs. صح? But what about when the Imam is in ghaybah? Al-musari'ina ila qadai hawa'ij. How can I go and help the Imam and serve the Imam and fulfill his hajah if he has a wish and need. When I can't even see him, I can't even access him. 
we serve the Imam during the state of Ghaiba, brothers and sisters, in two ways. Number one, spread knowledge and awareness about the Imam. Serve his cause. Many people don't know anything about the 12th Imam. Even many of the Shia of the Imam, what do they really know about the Imam? Besides, well, there's a 12th Imam in Ghaiba and he'll reappear one day and bring justice. Know how many traditions we have about Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman? What is our duty? You know, the Prophet, the Imams of Ahl Bayt, they all speak about the duties that we have during the Ghaibah and Intidhar. There's many a hadith where the Prophet, the Imams, they say, Intidhar al-Faraj, Afdalu a'mal ummati, Intidhar al-Faraj. Sahih? To wait for the Faraj. To wait for. What does waiting mean? Is it a passive concept? Is it an active concept? Just sit and wait? Or is it. No, it, it, it really is a, a reference to a, 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 few, a system, an entire system of obligations that we have. So, spread knowledge and awareness about the Imam. Many misconceptions there are about the 12th Imam. Why is he in the state of Ghaiba? What is he doing? What do I benefit from the Imam if someone asks me? My son comes or daughters ask me, how do I benefit from the Imam of my time if I can't see him, if I can't access him? These are all misconceptions. These are all questions that need someone to come and, and reply and answer. This is a way in which I serve the Imam. And number two, of course, I serve the cause and the mission of the Imam. When the Imam appears, he has two main objectives at least. Number one is what? Establish justice. That's why the Prophet says, he fulfills it with justice. And number two, eradicate poverty. This is another one of the missions of the 12th Imam. So if I want to serve the mission of the Imam, the cause of the Imam, then I have to serve these two missions, these two causes. Have I in any way tried to establish justice, to get rid of injustice in my circle? Whatever I can, in the limited scope that I can, within my family, within my circle of friends, within my extended family, within my community, have I been a cause for justice or a cause for injustice? If you want to serve the Imam during the state of Ghaiba, then serve his causes, serve justice. Try to spread justice and implement justice, even if it's, you know, you don't have too much power, and whatever power you have, whatever method you can. And number two, eradicate poverty. Can any one of us here eradicate poverty? No. Yes, you can help. You can help, even if it's 0.001% of Allah has blessed me, then these blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal, I share them with the less fortunate. So I'm showing the Imam that we are on the same team, we're on the same page. It's not just, well, I love the Imam and I remember him. The Imam says, look, when I come, I have a mission. If you have aligned yourself with that mission, then you are on my team. But if you are someone that is unjust with your own family, with your own spouse, with your own kids, with your own parents, with your own siblings, with people in your community, and then you expect Allah to make you a companion of the Imam, it's impossible. Why? Because there is a conflict in what? In the mission. There is a conflict in the objectives. The Imam has to eradicate injustice. And you are someone that is spreading injustice. How do you want to be on the same team with the Imam? So in these ways we can serve the Imam during the state of Ghaiba. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad. And finally, the fifth part of dua Al-Ahd, a very beautiful part, is when the Imam, and Imam al-Sadiq, speaks about the notion of a raj'ah, the return. The Imam then says, Allahumma in hala bayni wa baynahu al-mawt, alladhi ja'altahu ala ibadika hatman maqdiya. The question is, what if I die before the Imam comes, before he appears? What are the chances that we will live and see that day that the Imam appears and I can be amongst his supporters when he rises and he starts his movement. The chances many times probably low, right? So is it fair 
that I have all this love and passion for the Imam and I strive to support his mission and I really want and yearn to be amongst his companions but then I just I die and then someone else lucky a generation or five generations after me just happens to be born in the right time he gets the honor of being with the 12th Imam is that fair? We say that's not fair. Our forefathers, I bet many of them, many of the Shia for the last year, they had wished that there was an Imam of their time. When there was so much corruption and tyranny, especially upon the Shia of Ahlul Bayt. Anytime you look at brothers and sisters over the last century, over the last millennium, the Shia of Ahlul Bayt were always, were always targeted, and they always were subject to annihilation, to genocide. Any era that you choose, you'd be killed just for being Shia. You would be tortured. You would be persecuted. You would be discriminated. That's why many Shia had to live in Taqiyya. If I do not have to live in a state of Taqiyya, I have to thank Allah. Because many Shia were not that lucky. If they knew, the government knew that you were Shia, خلاص, it was over for you. Those people were not pious. Many of them were pious. They read Dua al They had that hope in the Imam. They tried to what? They tried to apply and follow on the path of the Imam, meaning establish justice in the way they can, eradicate poverty, stand for the truth, and so on. So, is it fair that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala denies them that honor just because they happened to die earlier? Of course not. This is the beautiful Dua of the Imam Sadiq, where he addresses this problem. The Imam says, if I happen to die before the reappearance, I ask you, Ya Allah, what do I ask you? فَأَخْرِجْنِي مِنْ قَبْرِي Resurrect me, raise me from my grave. فَأَخْرِجْنِي مِنْ قَبْرِي مُؤْتَزِرًا كَفَنِي شَاهِرًا سَيْفِي مُجَرِّدًا قَنَاتِي مُلَبِّيًا دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي فِي الْحَاضِرِ وَالْبَادِي I ask you, Ya Allah, to raise me from the dead while I'm wearing my kafan, holding my sword in one hand, in my other hand my spear, meaning I what? I'm ready to fight, I have the weapon ready, and I am what? Saying, لَبَّيْكَ يَا دَعِي Allah. I am answering the call of my Mawla Sahib al-Asli wal-Zaman to go and fight with him, protect him, defend him, fight for him in any way that I can. I ask you, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to give me that honor, and Allah will give you that honor. Because remember the Imam said, if you read this dua for 40 days, Allah Azza wa Jal will resurrect you with the Imam, when the Imam reappears. There's a beautiful hadith that Imam al-Sadiq speaks about. He speaks about a believer that dies and how the alam al-barzakh unfolds. What are the next steps that happen once the person is placed in their grave? It's a beautiful dua, it's long, I'll only take some parts. He says, فَإِذَا وُضِعَ الْمُؤْمِنْ فِي قَبْرِهِ When a mu'min, a believer, is placed in their grave, فُتِحَ لَهُ بَابٌ مِنْ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ يَدْخُلُ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ رُوحِهَا or رَوْحِهَا وَرَيْحَانِهَا Allah will open a door to paradise for you. Now, is it the Jannah of the Day of Judgment? Is it another paradise, a smaller Jannah? I said that's another topic. ثُمَّ يُفْسَحُ لَهُ عَنْ أَمَامِهِ مَسِيرَةَ شَهْرٍ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expand your horizons. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know it's a very tight grave, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow you to enter in paradise and you'll see it's such a huge vast place. Then look at one of the beauties. After we are placed in our grave and after the, the questioning, the reckoning, look at what happens. He says, ثُمَّ يَزُورُ عَالَ مُحَمَّدٍ فِي جِنَانِ رُضْوَةٍ Allahu Akbar. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala One of the honors, you know, one of the honors, one of the beauties of dying is that you will be revived spiritually just by seeing the Imams of the Hebrews. Imagine, you'll have a meal with them. يَزُورُ عَالَ مُحَمَّدْ فَيَأْكُلْ مَعَهُمْ مِنْ طَعَامِهِمْ وَيَشْرَبْ مِنْ شَرَابِهِمْ وَيَتَحَدَّثْ مَعَهُمْ فِي مَجَالِسِهِ you will sit with Ahlul Bayt Muhammad and Al Muhammad. You will eat with them. You will drink with them. And you will speak to them. Allahu Akbar. This is the greatest ni'mah 
Or so someone who's truly in love with Ahl Bayt Ma'ar says, Ya Allah, I don't want this dunya anymore. I just want to go to the next life so that I can see my masters, Muhammad and Al Muhammad. So you engage in that beautiful discussion, you have your meal with Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, and then the Imam says, Hatta yaquma qa'imuna. Until the twelfth Imam rises. Sahib al Asli wa Zaman khalas. He appears and he begins his revolution. Now, the Imam says, You will sit with Ahlul Bayt until. Now imagine someone died a thousand years ago. So they are still in that meeting with Ahlul Bayt. Now either, yes, somehow, you know, we don't understand exactly how Alam al barzakh works, or maybe because time there, you know, time is relative, it may pass much faster. So you're enjoying your time with the Ahlul Bayt, all of a sudden you hear that the 12th Imam has reappeared in the dunya. فَإِذَا قَامَ قَائِمُنَا بَعَثَهُمُ اللَّهِ مِنْ This dead person will be called back. Yalla, come back. Now here, you're kind of in a dilemma, but wait, I'm with Muhammad and I'm Muhammad. Sahib al-Asri wal-Zaman, that was my dream. I used to always say, Ya Allah al-Ajal al-Ajal, Allahumma j'alli min ansarih wa'awanih wal-Mustashadina. This is an honor beyond any honor. So of course you'll be so honored. In front of Ahlul Bayt, you tell them, excuse me, I have to go and defend and fight for your grandson, Ya Rasulullah. How proud you'll feel in front of Rasulullah that you were chosen, because not everyone gets chosen to go back in the Raja'ah. To fight with the Imam. So the Imam says, فَإِذَا قَامَ قَائِمُنَا بَعَثَهُمُ اللَّهِ فَأَقْبَلُوا مَعَهُ يُلَبُّونَ زُمَرًا زُمَرًا So you will see groups upon groups of believers just coming out of their graves. Allahu Akbar. It's like those zombie movies that you see. That's obviously not zombies. They are pious believers. And we have many traditions that speak about the raj'ah that will happen when the Imam reappears. And it says the best of the best. Man imana mahva. Those individuals that have what? Perfected their faith. Allah Azza wa Jal will bring them back to this dunya so that they can have the honor to be soldiers of the Imam. And they can witness the beautiful justice that the Imam. You know, living under the kingdom where the Imam is the king of the world. How beautiful is that? It's a dream come true. Allah Azza wa Jal will not deprive me that dream just because I die before. If you are someone that was a true Shia of Ahlul Bayt, if you are someone that yearned, asked Allah to make you amongst the companions of the Imam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that honor. That's why when we hear the stories of the Imam, he will conquer the world, and he will conquer Palestine, and he will this. It's, don't think it's just the followers and the people of that time. No! His army is made of people of his time and people from all the times. Asal, we have a hadith from one of the Imams where he says, Ashabul Kahf. Ashabul Kahf, the people of the cave, when did they live? Three, four, five, six thousand years ago? Sah? Ashabul Kahf. No, they're still sleeping till today. When will they wake up? When the twelfth Imam reappears. Allah tells them, Allah, now wake up. Now you will see the Savior of humanity. Go and fight with him. Salman al Farisi will come back, the hadith says. Abu Dujan al-Ansari will come back. Al-Maqdad ibn al-Aswad will come back. And the best of the best, the believers, those that really had the attachment with the Imam, who were sincere in their dua when they asked Allah to make them a companion of the Imam. So what a beautiful dua, brothers and sisters, that the Imam teaches us. Read this dua every day, it will take you fire. And look at all these beautiful benefits that I spoke about. It's a dhikr of Allah, reminds you of Allah. You're sending your blessings and dua for Ahlul Bayt and they will do dua for you. Number three, we said, pay your allegiance to remind yourself who your Imam is and who you should be concerned about in this life. Number four, you ask Allah to make you amongst the servants, the companions, the supporters of the Imam. And number five, the Raj'ah. If you die, you ask Allah to resurrect you with Sahih al if you maintain this habit, brothers and sisters, and I mentioned this a couple of nights ago when I spoke about من أخلص لله من أخلص لله أربعين صباحا نيته أو عبادته 40 days if you purify your intentions and acts then Allah will give you what? Basira and Allah will give you zuhud in the dunya. We said 40 days it doesn't mean on day 41 go back to your old methods. It doesn't mean 40 days recite dua 
العهد أن أجلس لي فأنه when you do something for 40 days بعد it becomes a habit يعني at least 40 days because it takes at least 40 days for something to become easy for you become second nature and to become a habit we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the honor and the opportunity that we can all insha'Allah recite this beautiful dua and we can insha'Allah all be motivated and inspired by the beautiful teachings of this dua.